I'm going to go ahead and hit record. And all right. All right. So uh, welcome. Um, I am Ben Brown. I'm the owner of BSL Nutrition, uh, where we make smart nutrition simple. Uh, and I'm joined by Dan Dodd, owner of DexaFit. Dan, how you doing? Good, Ben. Good. How you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you, brother. Dan and I go way back. Um, we've known each other for, for what, about the last 15 years or so? Yep. Um, we were roommates in graduate school at Arizona State University. So we know each other pretty well. Um, we've, we've come up through the ranks, so to speak, together in terms of uh, um, both you know, events through National Strength and Conditioning Association, through personal training, through um, basically just being in the fitness and, and nutrition and wellness industry for the last 15 years together and, and all of the uh, ebbs and flows that come with that. And so I'm, I'm really happy to be interviewing you, Dan, on your new venture. Um, why don't you uh, just, just give us a quick little background on, uh, on what's going on with you, what, what sort of led you to this point with uh, where you are now with DexaFit? Yeah, uh, you know, we, you know, obviously we, we've gone back and, you know, we've followed each other's career paths uh, for quite some time. And I sort of went the academic side of things, which, which was really good and, and I thoroughly enjoyed and, and I still do a little bit on the academic side. But, um, you know, I worked in a, uh, I ran a fitness, uh, sorry, an exercise physiology lab for the past five years at Illinois State. And, uh, you know, we do very similar testing. We do body composition, uh, metabolic testing, cardiovascular testing, you know, the, the whole gamut of, of tests. And, and uh, you know, as I was sort of playing around uh, probably last summer, um, you know, I was looking at different, we we're looking at equipment and different things. And, and all of a sudden, uh, DexaFit popped up. And, I, you know, knowing that the Dexa is one of the, uh, you know, body composition tests and, and the gold standard, we know professionally that it's the gold standard. I want to sort of find out a little bit more and, you uh, you know, one thing led to the other. I started reaching out to the owners of DexaFit, and, and uh, basically, what it is, it's uh, we have 13 locations around the country, so we have 13 affiliates. So they're all independent uh, companies that, that work under that umbrella. So, you know, we have a uh, you know an affiliate fee that we pay that you know as far as marketing and, and promotions and website maintenance and things like that. So, I like the fact that this is my own business, but I, I still want work under the umbrella of, of uh, some guiding principles and things like that. So. It seemed to be a natural progression. I was doing very similar work at the university and uh, I've been looking at uh, uh, business opportunities for, for quite some time. And this just was, it was a good fit for me, especially a, a great uh, move from, from obviously the, the lab to my own lab. Um, yeah. It's kind of nice. Uh, so, 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 so you've been in academia your, your whole career up until now and, and sort of, over the last few years, you've sort of been thinking about venturing off into creating your own business, but but obviously utilizing all of the methodology that you've been using throughout your career in terms of exercise physiology testing and everything like that, right? And yeah. so t tell us a little bit more about exactly what is DexaFit, what does it do, who is it catered to, um, what sort of services do you guys offer? Yep, so the three, the three main areas that we look at we do the body composition analysis using a DEXA. So you can see the arm behind me. So what it is, it's a, it's a long table, uh, takes a shoot, shoots a small amount of radiation through, takes a snapshot, you know, goes along the body. And, and uh, from that, we can look at the, the tissue, uh, those measurements. So we get the lean tissue, the fat tissue, and then we get the bone density as well. So we can actually look at the, uh, the level of bone mineral content, which is, which is great. Uh, it's the only device out there that uh, commercially now that can do that. Um, so it's sort of nice to have, but yeah. So now we can look at, you know, body composition from the top end, as opposed to using biological impedance devices or, right. or skin folds. And so that's uh, sort of the major part of the business. And then we do some cardiovascular assessments, uh, VO2 max testing, anaerobic threshold analysis. We look at uh, substrate testing, uh, different the amount of fat and carbohydrates that's being used um, during levels of intensity. Uh, and then we also do resting metabolic rates. So we have people lay down and, and go ahead and find out what their metabolic rate is in a resting position. And then we can start managing nutrition, which, you know, obviously you, you're very familiar with. And so we sort of look at, uh, um, you know, the both ends of the spectrum. And going back to your sort of point before, one of the reasons why I really enjoyed this, uh, this business is because, 
people should be testing. You and I have been, we've worked together for many years and we were, you know, always testing athletes at some period, uh, period of time. And, and uh, it's an essential part. It's often a neglected part uh, when we talk about trainers and coaches, just because of, uh, because of a time commitment, maybe not an understanding of the, uh, the tests themselves or the results and what it actually means. You know, uh, so for me, I actually saw the value of thinking, okay, well, you know, if we're trying to put people in directions and try and put people from A to B, well, we got to find out what A is first, right? So, so that's where Dexfit comes in. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a good point. That makes perfect sense. Um, so you've got the body, co- body composition, and, and so you assess body composition so you can find out someone's body fat levels with the DEXA scan, similar to um, what we were talking about previously or what a lot of trainers do is they do caliper testing. And that's more superficial body fat testing. Obviously, we can't test uh, the the depth of uh, of our amount total amount of body fat. It, it uses a bit of an algorithm, right? Depending on the formula that we use. But so there's you know so people understand there's a lot of different methodology in terms of pe- testing body fat. And 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 what I often um, talk to people about is you know there's no real way to, to really determine exactly how much or the total percent of body fat unless, right, we're, we're doing an autopsy or something like that. So, um, we, but we do want something that's repeatable, right? And, and, and um, that has high validity, you know, from, from test to test, which what we know in the industry is the DEXA scan is, is kind of the gold standard of, of body composition testing. So what have you noticed? Um, the difference, like what's the main difference between the DEXA scan versus if they're working with their personal trainer and their personal trainers may be doing three site or five site, or even, you know, I work with a lot of practitioners. We do 12 site body, body composition testing. Um, and, and then I guess I'll correlate that to um, the other popular methodology is bioelectrical impedance. And there's a lot of big devices on the market like the in-body um, and may, so maybe you could explain um, the differences between uh, those those methodologies. Yeah, yeah. You know, skin folds have been around for for decades, and and uh, it's a great uh, it's a great form. But again, as you mentioned, it just takes the superficial fat. We don't get to see what uh, what's underlying. Uh, you know, one of the good things about the DEXA it does do a visceral fat analysis, yes. so it does find out how much fat is around those internal organs. So when we talk about a health perspective, yeah. Uh, you know, we, we can get into a little bit from that one. But, you know, one of the biggest, one of the major problems with skin fold testing is the, the intertester, well, two things, the intratester reliability and the intertester reliability. So, you know, who's to say that that, that trainer is actually getting the same pinch, the same size totally. every time. Uh, and then if they're going from one person to the next, well, who knows what, what tests they're doing and what sites they're doing and, you know, levels of pinch and things like that. So, you know, even with those built-in equations, that, that estimation then starts to, to shimmel out a little bit, um, you know, depending on, on what's going on. And then, you know, even levels of adiposity, uh, when we start getting up to, to people with a higher percent of body fat may not be as easy to, to grasp those. Totally. Um, so then we sort of have some, are we just throwing it up in the air and guessing or, or are we actually getting what's, what's really there? So, you know, that's with the, with the skin folds. And, and again, it's, it's not a bad measure. It's just, you know, when we talk about gold standards and things like that, we just now have uh, more applicable measures. Um, the in bodies probably take it a little bit closer, the, the bioelectrical impedance. Um, but again, with those, they're based on levels of resistance. So when you, when you go ahead and you, and you take hold of whether the handheld or the foot to foot, it's taking the electrical current through the body and it's based on water. So it's, it's ice and that current, but the quicker, the, the less resistance it gets through the body, you know, the, the, the quicker that means obviously more. The assumption is that more muscle is going to be able to hold more water. So there's going to be less resistance. So the current's going to pass through. Right. Quicker, and then you're going to have a lower percent body fat because you're going to be more lean, but it's based on the premise of uh, hydration. So right. people's variation levels of, of hydration are going to impact that. And that's where on a consistency basis or, or a liability basis, you know, you think about when most people get tested, they get tested here. Well, let's say in three months, we're about to get into summer. It could be 100 degrees Mm -hmm. in Arizona. And obviously, maybe a little bit dehydrated. That's going to throw things uh, off a little bit. Um, And it's still based on the assumption that 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 lean tissue holds specifically that amount of water. And then they can make the assumption that that's how much lean tissue. Right. 
again, not bad, but uh, uh, there's a few issues with, with those. But um, but again, you know, they're, they're close approximations. But um, that sort of goes to the to the to the point of the value of the Dexter is, you know, is close enough, good enough, especially when you're trying to repeat the test. Right. Uh, and, and that's the biggest advantage with the Dexter is we know it's going to give consistent measures every time. Uh, so we can give people a little bit more reliable information when we're saying, okay, well, you're 17% here and now you're 15% instead of maybe going, okay, you're 17 here and, and well, maybe you could be 20%, maybe you could be 14%. Right. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and you make some great points in that because, I mean, from a, from a well, I've done thousands of um, of caliper measurements over the years now and and I've noticed huge variations, of course, is um, if we're working with a female and where she is in her menstrual cycle, obviously she's going to be retaining certain, you know, more water leading into her menstrual cycle and, and various times throughout throughout the month. And so that makes a very big difference um, in terms of weight and then in terms of how that algorithm uh, uses the weight in terms of classifying percentage of body fat. And then similarly is when you talk about um, someone that's very over fat or someone that, that has both a lot of, um, of adipose tissue and visceral, and visceral fat is sometimes they're very difficult to measure. Like you physically can't get a hold of the amount of body fat and or they're so inflamed that their tissue is so rigid, it's, it's nearly impossible to get an accurate measurement. And that's becoming the case you know, more and more as, we, as our population becomes more you know, over fat and it's just, a, it's just a sad fact. And so, you know, oftentimes I'm talking to people about not putting too much, and like I said before, not putting too much emphasis into that total number, but, but using it just as one modality to track progress, you know, across the journey. And then same deal with the bioelectrical impedance is it's so heavily influenced by hydration levels. So if you were to measure, you know, whether it be the same day, but you measure different times of the day, it's going to give you a different number. And so it's very difficult for people, especially general population, to be very consistent about saying, look, you need to measure upon waking without anything in your system. You know, again, as a female, somewhere in her menstrual cycle, something like that, it's gonna throw those, those results off. So something having, you know, having something like the DEXA scan that you know, doesn't necessarily take those factors into account and, and can create a little more reliability across the board is really important, especially if we're working with someone who's maybe has a fat loss goal and saying, okay, over the course of the next 12 weeks, you know, we want to see from like, let's say they're coming in every two to four weeks or something like that. Well, that could be incredibly discouraging to measure once and then come in, you know, three or four weeks later and have the number presented as something higher when in actuality, you know, they may just have different hydration levels um, and maybe a different time of day, right? Something like that. So it's, it's really good points. Um, so you had mentioned testing resting metabolic rate. Can you um, dive into that a little bit more, kind of explain what that is and how we would utilize it? So, you know, uh, we, we see it more so here from a weight loss standpoint. So people that are looking to really lose weight and it's not, you know, it's heavily used for a weight loss uh, sort of category, I guess, but we do have athletic populations that are looking at it from a weight gain and it becomes valuable for that information. But there's two, there's two factors. So you have your basal metabolic rate and then you have your resting metabolic rate. Um, the basal metabolic rate is, is the minimum amount of, of energy that you're body needs to maintain all its operation, uh, operating uh, systems, but it's hard to capture. You can only capture that in an enclosed room, obviously controlling everything and, and uh, you know, a person's gotta be uh, sleeping and, and we're trying to measure the amount of oxygen that's being uh, consumed, the amount of carbon dioxide that's being uh, expelled. We really, from a practitioner standpoint, we really can't make that happen because that's more of a, a very, very clinical uh, setting. So we take it a, a step further and we can look at a resting metabolic rate, which is very similar, but obviously people have woken up, they're now active or, or somewhat active, and we try to get them in a very rested state for, for a period of time, and we're still doing the same thing. We're still measuring uh, the amount of oxygen that's being consumed versus the amount of carbon dioxide that's being expelled. And from that, we know that when we metabolize um, you know, energy, uh, 
to allow our body to operate. We're use, using oxygen to do that. Well, we know based on how much oxygen is being used, we can find out how much energy is actually being metabolized. Uh, so that's what we're using is we're, we're examining how much is actually being utilized and then taking that information to find out how many uh, calories are being expended uh, to maintain operations in the body. And why that's valuable is we can find out in a resting state, okay, so you wake up in the morning, you lay there, we can find out how much energy your body needs if you stayed like that for the no. next 24 hours. So from a weight loss standpoint, and I give you, it doesn't make too much sense until you give, them, uh, give people some analogies. You know, if somebody's, which I quite often see, uh, resting metabolic rate comes out at 1500, uh, which yeah. is about typical for, for most females and about uh, 1800 to 2000 for, for most guys. I might have individuals that come in that are only consuming 1100 calories a day. Or right. 1200 calories a day. So they're not even meeting the, the minimum requirements for their, and that's not taking into consideration their general activity or their physical activity or exercise. So, you know, they're only consuming, uh, you know, this much, but they're actually expending that much. Well, their body, you would think, okay, your body would lose weight, but in, in essence, your body may not be, may be holding on to that uh, and not releasing that fat for energy purposes. Right. It's, it's saying, hey, well, we need it. Our body needs to, to, to keep using that because we need to stay alive. Um, so getting back to your point though, the, the value of the resting metabolic rate is we wanna find out what's that minimum level. And then we wanna get an idea of, a, of an individual's activity level on a daily basis or their exercise level. And then we can start measuring, uh, uh, monitoring their nutrition and their right. exercise programs. Um, but we also go a little bit a step further when we look at uh, protein intake. So we try to combine the DEXA uh, with the, the RMRs because we can look at lean tissue levels. Yes. And we know two things. We know when people lose weight, they typically have a reduction in their RMR. That's a natural uh, progression when people lose weight. But what we don't want to do is lose muscle mass. Exactly. Uh, we know the advantage of maintaining muscle mass from energy expenditure, daily activity levels, you know, performance, you name it. The value of the, the lean tissue is important. So we sort of combine that information to try and keep people when they're doing nutritional programs to maintain their levels. We get them into resistance training and then sort of combine that information to, to make sure that yes, if they do lose weight, or if they do reduce their, their caloric intake, we're preserving some of that lean tissue. So yeah, they have that, that, the negative effects on their, on their body. Yeah. That's, that's a great point combining the DEXA and, um, the perceived RMR. So, so we could, we could look at their DEXA scan and we could say, okay, you have, you know, 175 pounds of, of lean muscle tissue. And, and, you know, we know in certain nutrition classifications, we would say, okay, well, you know, we know we, you need to be consuming at least a gram of protein per pound of lean body mass as an example. And so you've got that number right there. And then, so once we understand their protein needs, then we can use the RMR and say, okay, well, if you need 2,000 calories per day at rest, and then you're exercising an additional, say, 500 calories, you know, on average or something like that, we can say, okay, so based on 2,500 calories, we know we need, you know, we, we have X percentage, so whatever, 175 times four grams, four calories per gram. So you could right then and there know what their protein needs are, um, and depending on whether or not they're trying to obviously gain muscle mass or lose body fat, we could tweak the, the, the formula accordingly. So that would be very valuable information for both the general population to have, especially um, and well, anyone who's trying to lose body fat or trying to gain muscle mass, right? And, and it would be easy to fluctuate their protein needs based on their lean, understanding their, their true lean muscle mass. Um, and, then, uh, and then it would be really valuable information as I see it for any personal trainers to have or nutritionists um, so that they could more reasonably put together their a nutrition plan for their clients, right? Like I know I'll get sort of a perceived RMR based on depending on like which body fat testing methodology I use. And then we'll kind of, and then I'll first establish a protein goal. So whether it's, um, if someone's trying to increase muscle mass, we'll usually go, you know, at least one gram of, of protein kind of per pound or per pound of lean, lean muscle mass um, and above uh, for increasing muscle mass and then sticking around there for fat loss. Um, but kind of based on that, then uh, 
I can use that number and start them there and give them a plan to start there. So this would be really valuable information for a personal trainer and nutritionist to have because then you could start them and then you can obviously just track the progress. And if you go, you know, a couple weeks and you see, okay, well, yeah, you're losing body fat. Like if they come in and measure with the DEXA scan every couple weeks, okay, great. You're losing maybe half a percent every week or, or thereabouts, then we're on a really good path. You know, maybe you're losing a pound a week, a pound to two pounds, depending on how aggressive we're being. And you have a very good idea of how the client's progressing. Um, and, and then it also tells you how you would need to tweak the program because obviously if nothing's changing or they're on a fat loss plan, but they're gaining weight, well, then we've got some issues and we need to adjust their caloric intake, right? Yep. And that, you know, it brings up a good point because, uh, um, you know, one of the, the, the things I've noticed with being at testing facilities, we have people that say, you know, well, I don't want to test because maybe I don't want to know. And, you know, and that's coming from trainers as well. They're like, well, I don't really, you know, I don't really want to know if, if things are changing too much. I'm sort of just going to eyeball it and go from there. And, and whether it be a, a fear that maybe their program's not being effective because, because people are paying money for, it, for results, right. right? But, you know, on the, on the backside is, shouldn't that be a good thing? Shouldn't that be to hold people more accountable yeah. to, well, hey, look at your program. Maybe there's something that you can tweak a little bit and, and get people going. Maybe, you know, and it's not just accountability for the trainers, but accountability for the, for the client. Hey, did you really follow what we talked about? Did you really right. you know, take that, that approach? And, and uh, so, you know, that becomes the value for those numbers. But, you know, going back to your point, I mean, that's absolutely right. What, that's exactly what we do with this information from the nutritional side and say, hey, these are your levels. Here's what we think you can play with. Let's monitor now. Let's, let's tighten it up and then, and then uh, you know, bring it back in and get checked again. Yeah, that's, that's really good stuff. That's really valuable stuff. So, okay, so we, we covered the DEX, so we covered the RMR, and then you also mentioned the VO2 max testing. So let's talk about VO2 max, um, well, certainly what it is, um, how it's applicable to both athletes, and then how, how would the VO2 max be applicable to the general population? Yeah, so the VO2 max typically has always been a, a for an athletic population a performance variable for uh, finding out what levels of fitness. Now, I'll talk about it from the from the just general population first. It's a great identifier of levels of cardiovascular fitness. So, from yeah. a health cardiovascular risk factor, we can use that test and that information to identify how likely is that person to, to possibly have some cardiovascular based issues and and uh, from their from their result. On the other side of it, we look at it from a performance standpoint, but we don't tend to look at, well, it seems in the field now, we're not looking at just uh, go to max as, as an indicator of performance uh, because, you know, let's say somebody comes out and they have a VO2 max of 50 and you have two people that come out and they have a VO2 max of 50, well, they can still very, they can still perform very differently in a race. So the VO2 max gives us a general idea of, of uh, levels of fitness and performance. Yeah. But we can take it a step further and we can look at anaerobic threshold and that point where blood lactate starts to accumulate too much and affect performance. So we can say, okay, well, here's your VO2 max, here's your anaerobic threshold, and then we can organize training programs based on it. Do they need to get fitter? or do they need to, to work on improving their anaerobic threshold? Um, so what we do with the VO2 max test is I'll come in and we can do a walking protocol. We can do a running protocol. Uh, I have a, a trainer set up. So anyone that's a cyclist can come in and get a, a cycling uh, test as well. So they'll come in and we do, basically we do what's called a ramping protocol where we either increase speed or incline or, or resistance to the bike and uh, have people go from a very low effort all the way up to, to maximum until they can't do any more and they're completely spent. At the same time, I should have one there. At the same time, we have a mask for them and uh, it's closed in and we're actually uh, recording the same as the RMR. We're, we're recording the amount of oxygen that's been consumed versus the amount of carbon dioxide uh, that's been uh, expelled. And from that, we can start to look at uh, what substrate's been used, whether it be fat or whether it be carbohydrate. Uh, when we talk about blood lactate, for example, we know that, you know, especially when we stay get to those levels, we're really expelling a lot of carbohydrates. You know, we're, we're trying to buffer uh, the blood lactate in the blood and, and that becomes the, the, uh, the outcome. So from that, we can start to play around from a training standpoint, purposely an endurance training standpoint um, for most of our athletes. For general population, though, we can still use the same information. Um, and we talked a little bit about this uh, yesterday that, you know, you might have somebody that comes in and you'll say, well, what are you doing right now? And they say, well, I go for a walk every morning and I go for a walk and I walk 20 minutes or, or 30 minutes. 
we can mimic that intensity on, on the treadmill with the gas and find out what's happening metabolically. Uh, is what they're doing uh, actually an advantage for them? Are they using uh, a lot of fat as their dominant fuel source? Or do they need to go longer? Or do they need to go harder? Or do they need to maybe incorporate a little bit more high intensity uh, interval training of some kind to try and get their system to respond a little bit differently? So, so that's really what the value is for for the VO2 max and, and the substrate analysis. Is we can it's it's purely a programming oriented test. Um, it really helps people identify what they should be doing from a cardiovascular side, whether it be endurance for athletes or just, uh, you know, selection modality, uh, long, slow distance or long, slow right. stuff or some high intensity interval stuff. Yeah. yeah. With the, with the increased popularity, um, and justifiably so of like hit training, high intensity interval training and the value of, of doing hit training as it pertains to increasing VO2 max and total cardiovascular fitness, right? We know that, um, you can mimic the effects of long, slow distance cardio training with some short bursts of high intensity, which is very cool. Um, and a lot of people are getting interested and a lot of trainers are implementing into their clients' programs. So in my mind, I see um, the VO2 submax testing as a means to um, just look at improved um, aerobic and anaerobic threshold levels, right? Of just, of just classifying aerobic fitness. And so for those people, you know, especially those people that like to see progress and like to see numbers, um, and same for the trainers as well in terms of assessing their clients' progress, but being able to see that their client's actually improving, you know, from week to week, month to month in terms of their cardiovascular fitness, especially someone that's coming from maybe a sedentary state, um, uh, maybe on a, a weight loss plan. And then even for someone who's like a quote unquote weekend warrior that really wants to get more serious about their cardiovascular fitness and actually seeing that what they're doing is, is making a difference. Um, I would envision that to be pretty beneficial aspect of the VO2. And then the one other thing I'll add when you talked about the substrate utilization. So basically what we're talking about is when someone's depending on the, and correct me if I'm wrong, but depending on the type of exercise or the intensity of the exercise that someone's doing, we're basically burning different levels of fats and carbohydrates and proteins. And, and so as we work towards higher intensities, we're becoming more carbohydrate dominant. And then conversely, if we're just, let's say, not doing anything or we're just going for a slow walk, we're, we're going to be utilizing more fat as fuel. Is that, is that correct? And so something that I've encountered throughout my career and, and something that's, um, I guess potentially a big, very big issue is um, one thing I see is for recreational aerobic athletes, and let's use runners as an example, is the, I would say probably like the majority of runners in general are pretty slow runners, um, or they're not terribly competitive. They're just doing it for the fun of it, which is, which is great, but they're not, they're not running at such high intensities that they're going to be utilizing tons of carbohydrate as fuel. Yep. Does that sound right? And, and so, you know, typically we see runners competing in like half marathons and they're running maybe, you know, nine or 10 plus minute miles, I, I would say would probably be pretty realistic, in which case it's important for them to understand that they're probably utilizing a lot more fat as fuel because it's a it's really a relatively low intensity endeavor versus those that are terribly competitive and they're using a lot more carbohydrate as their predominant energy source and my point in that is that we have a lot of people that have body composition concerns that are running because they're they're using it as a way to burn calories as a way to lose body fat but when they're running they're consuming a tremendous amount of carbohydrate because of the perception that just because they're exercising, they need to be taking in more fuel, when in reality is they're moving so slowly, and it's no offense, but they're moving so slowly that they really are just burning mostly fat. Is that right? Yeah, yeah the relative intensity, yeah. So, so somebody that, uh, you know, maybe you know, going for a, for a half marathon, maybe just a, a nice slow jog because they're just, they're not trained, they're not accustomed to, to running at, at higher intensities versus, you know, some of our lead endurance athletes, they're running at, at the threshold or just below for an entire for an entire race, you know they're, they're you know we had some in here that are you know six thirty uh, minute miles for an entire half marathon. Exactly, it's you know, crazy. Um, 
So yeah, they're different levels, but for those individuals, yeah, they're going to be expending a lot more carbohydrate through two and a half, three hours of a, of a, of a race. Um, but I'm saying that too, that you get somebody that, uh, you know, is a little bit lower intensity relative to their, uh, to their effort level. Um, but they, you know, as far as a half marathon, they may be doing a, a two or three hour half marathon, which, you know, like yeah. Tom, yeah, they're burning more, uh, uh, more fat. And then that, the carbohydrate is just because of longevity of the, of the race. But yeah, they're burning, they're going to be burning mostly fat during that, uh, that period of time. But we yeah. And so, and so they're kind of sabotaging themselves because, you know, let's say they're in their training, you know, maybe they're training multiple times per week and they're taking tons of gel packs and Gatorade type drinks and stuff like that. But really what's happening is just ending being a tremendous amount of excess carbohydrate and, and potentially excess calories. Um, so, so the point being that it would be valuable for them to kind of understand where their substrate utilization or how much fat, protein, and carbs they're actually utilizing depending on the intensity levels so that they can just then get a much better idea of how they should be consuming those fuels, you know, in and around their workouts. Right. And you're never going to, you know, ultimately you can deplete your, your stores, but you're never going to be able to play catch up in a, in typically in a marathon right. setting, but we just try and keep the, the levels elevated a little bit, but you're right. You know, people that are training, you know, they, they probably don't need to be throwing down a ton of Gatorades and, and uh, gel packs during an eight mile or a 10 mile right. uh, training session. But, yeah, if they go to a half marathon or they go to a marathon, then, then we educate them on that. And, and that's how we find. So uh, we can get not only the total caloric expenditure, but we can also get the split between fats and carbohydrates, which is really nice for people to see. Because then, yeah, we can start to manage that a little bit, a little bit better as far as how much carbohydrate they should be actually consuming. Very cool. Um, so, so you guys do so, – so you work with – obviously, you work with athletes – you work with general population and then you work with trainers that themselves come in and get tested and, you know, utilize them, the testing methods and then um, their clients as well. So talk to me about kind of what a typical, what the typical process is for someone that comes in or someone that's looking to come in and, and get tested. Yeah. So, so we go through, so there's some pre-test protocols that we try to make sure that everybody has. So we, just to try and get a clean slate across the board, we, we try to make sure that nobody's having any food for about three or four hours, don't exercise for about three or four hours, avoid caffeine, uh, just to really just get a clean slate so that we, we do that each time. So going back to your point about validity and reliability, we want to make sure that we're getting those same clean pitches every time. Um, whether it be the DEXA or the VO2 max, it's not as dependent for the, for the DEXA, uh, but it is, it is very important for the, for the resting metabolic rate and the DEXA because we want to find out exactly, uh, sorry, resting metabolic rate and the VO2 because we want to find out a clean picture of what's happening <laughs> metabolically uh, through their system. So, um, but a client will come in, we obviously have our, our uh, forms they'll fill out, we'll find out uh, what they're doing. Depending on the test, we'll go through, we'll get them set up uh, as far as the, the test itself. We'll run through the test and then I sit down with them and, and go through the results uh, for about anywhere from 20, 30 minutes to an hour, depending on, on the number of tests they've had, the type of tests they've had, uh, and go from there. Now, if they have a trainer or a coach already, then I like to bring that trainer and coach in or, or get them involved as much as possible because, you know, obviously they're going to see them more than I will on a daily basis. You know, most coaches and trainers I work with here are, you know, anywhere from three times a week to, to six times a week, you know, and they're going to have a much major, much more major impact on that person's, uh, you know, goals and, and uh, ability to get to their goals than I will on just a, you know, a half hour, an hour uh, appointment. So if that's the case, and it's really good to try and get that, uh, that group together because then we can talk, we can look at the, the whole training program. The, the coach can now look at the results and listen to how I'm breaking them down and also find out, okay, is that how I'm training the person? Is that how I'm programming that, that individual? Can I tweak a few things? They ask questions, I ask questions. And then we really try and take that sort of holistic approach and say, let's look at nutrition, let's look at your exercise routine, let's look at your stress levels, let's look at everything. And let's come up with a good plan for the next, you know, two to three months. Um, you know, I try to get people in, you know, one to two months span. Three months is good, but uh, what we what we can often find is people fall off the wagon. Yeah. Uh, in three months, so they they start really well, but then you know, uh, maybe not as good for that sort of back third. Uh, totally. 
So, you know, one month is, is for those people that are, are aggressive and they really take a, a really strong approach at, at making some changes. But two months gives us a good, good picture of what's happening and then we do the same thing and, and, and go from there. Yeah, I mean, I would envision, you know, even from an accountability standpoint, is if someone knows, you know, that they're going to come in and get measured again, they're going to be a lot, it, odds are good, they're going to be a lot more compliant. Um, and so, you know, I could, I could see certainly getting measured every few weeks to a month and then just kind of knowing, like, and then setting up in advance, knowing that they're coming in to get those measurements. So that sounds awesome. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been sort of having a little bit of a, uh, we say it's an informal competition with one of the trainers here uh, in town, and one of the, you know, owns a business in, Todd, who you uh, interviewed. Um, yeah. yeah. So, and not that we're competing against each other, but we had Dexes around the same time and, and just, just sits in the back of the head that, hey, we're about due for that next Dexa yeah. coming up here in the next week. So it's the same thing. I'm accountable. He's accountable. We're just sort of, you know, thinking that it's not far away and we, we you know, keeps us on time. Well, you know, when you're uh, when you're over fifty years old, I mean, it becomes a lot harder to lose body fat. So, <laughs> uh, just playing. Um, cool, man. That sounds great. Well, uh, anything else that? Uh, no, I mean, we just, you know, one of the things I guess uh, probably more so important, and you know, you and I are a little bit different. We started out very differently. I was more, um, you know, coming from. Uh, sort of perform well I guess we're, we're both the same from, you know strength and conditioning and performance and, and more the exercise part but you really went nutrition uh, side uh, once we sort of finished uh, our degree programs and and I kept going from the uh, from the strength and conditioning side but I got to tell you once I've been back in this uh, industry again uh, especially as an owner and working with individuals you know I forget how important nutrition was and, and not saying I didn't I forgot about it it's just you see the value of it and uh, you know so working with guys like yourself is great because you know we bring that back into the, the scope people focus maybe too much on the on the exercise side and not enough on, on the nutrition side yeah yeah definitely I mean look you know it's I mean we you know we're it matters what we're putting in our mouth uh, day in and day out and obviously we only have so many exercise sessions or can only make time for so many exercise sessions and and then we'll even as you know we can't compensate with exercise for what we're eating that and that's just not a healthy healthy way to go about doing it which a lot of people think that they can do especially when they're younger but we know as we're getting older that it just doesn't work like that and you've got to be a lot more diligent and consistent about the nutrition and supplementation and and lifestyle factors and stress management and sleep and all of that stuff so it's, I think it's awesome that you're you're plugging all of that stuff in for people. It really sounds like a comprehensive approach that they're getting when they come in to see you. Um, with that said, mm -hmm. is you know talk about where people can come in, where they can find you, and where they can find you know the Dexafit locations. Yeah, so I'm based in Central Illinois in Bloomington Normal, so we're about two hours uh, south of Chicago. We have two locations in Chicago. We have uh, Houston. Uh, Dallas, uh, New Orleans, Vegas, San Francisco. Uh, I'm missing a, a few. Uh, okay. Tampa, uh, down in Boca, down there. Uh, some great locations, really doing some good things down there. And, and uh, so they're popping up. We're, we're expanding every day and, and uh, hoping to have, you know, I think, close to 20 by the end of the, uh, the year, uh, which would be great. And, you know, we're the first business to be able to commercialize uh, the DEXA. Uh, you know, it still has very clinical orientations. We still have to go through radiation checks and training and, and whatnot. So it still has that very clinical, but uh, it's it's more available now for people to go and schedule in versus having to go, you know, meet with a doctor first, then get yeah. referred, then, you know, and that could take anywhere from two weeks to three weeks to get done versus people can just give me a call and, and you know, book them in that day. So Cool. Yeah. Um, what's the what's the website where they can find the Dexafit? Dexafit.com. Uh, yep, is the pretty standard. And then uh, you can go through locations, find uh, Central Illinois. But I'm on uh, Facebook at uh, Dexafit Central Illinois. Uh, you can follow us along, and and uh, usually I'm plugging your stuff. And you know. <laughs> yeah, right on. And um, uh, what if someone wanted to get a hold of you personally? Yep. Uh, so they can give me a call or shoot me an email at Dan Dodd at Dexafit.com. Uh, or three zero nine seven zero six four three six three. Awesome! Thanks a lot, brother. Um, it's been a pleasure as always, and uh, do this more often. Yeah, we'll talk again soon. All right, bud. Yeah. Yep. See ya.